Thank you for coming. Yet another event for Bands for Europe. Uh, for those of you, I'm sure there's a few familiar faces and some that haven't uh, been here before. Um, we're a volunteer group, we're non party political, and we're campaigning to stop Brexit basically. Um, since about April, we've been part of the People's Votes campaign, uh, trying to campaign for a referendum on the final deal, which when I joined in January, February, really felt like pie in the sky that would uh, absolutely never happen. But here we are, six or seven months later, and it, it seems to be a very small or larger possibility than it was. Um, there are now actually 174 groups around the country, similar to ours, who are campaigning as part of People's Vote from Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, all across England, and even in Spain, in Gibraltar, and in all sorts of areas. So it's, it's really fantastic and we're a, a very fast-growing group. So I just wanted to call out a couple of things that are coming up in our diary. This Sunday, the Pulse for Europe, uh, we have our monthly demonstration in Bath City Centre. We have a Christmas-themed one this uh, month, which will be a little bit different. We won't be uh, meeting in the Abbey Churchyard. We'll be in front of the Guild Hall because of the Christmas market. Obviously, everyone knows that. Um, so come in fine voice, we have some alternative Christmas carols for everyone to uh, get uh, involved with and uh, we'll do a mix of noise and, and do some festive fun with that. Uh, and then next Saturday, so that's the 8th of September, is our last National Action Day before the vote in Parliament. So we'll be organising street stalls, we'll be organising all sorts of things, and we'd like as many people to be involved as possible. So if next Saturday you're available, look out on our Facebook page, our newsletter, and we'll be trying to involve as many people as possible to make as much noise uh, before Parliament votes on the deal the following week. Okay, so to this evening, uh, we obviously have for the first time an all-female lineup, which I'm personally very proud to uh, introduce. Uh, really fantastic. Three of our Southwest MEPs, uh, all three of which have worked tirelessly to um, uh, support our cause or represent us, the UK, within the European Parliament, and have been doing so for very many years. Um, also chaired by our local MP Vera Hophouse. Um, she has also been a tireless campaigner uh, against Brexit, and I'm going to pass on to her, and she will introduce you to all these uh, very fine ladies. Thank you for coming and enjoying the evening. Good evening. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. After a fractious week in Parliament, it's always good to be back in Bath. It is a particular pleasure to be here with fellow campaigners, um, passionate pro-Europeans, Claire Moody, Julie Gerling and Molly Scott Cato, who have been a really fantastic champions um, for uh, the European Union within the Southwest. And I'm so grateful um, to see you here. We have been sharing platforms together um, and it is really good to see you here in Bath. We are going to have um, the, uh, the evening is sort of inter it, it, so each of uh, um, our MEPs are going to make their pitch between sort of five ten minutes, not really more, because we all really want to sort of have it as an interactive event rather than talking to you from the front. Um, so we are doing that in the first half of the um, of the evening, and then we have a short break, and then we are starting our question and answer sessions. As usual, I would urge you to ask questions rather than making long statements from the floor, although I know um, we all want to say our bit about why um, for us it is so important to stay in the European Union. Just a, full, a few words from me, because I'm always being asked, my goodness, what is going on in Parliament? Um, what is going on in Parliament is a complete impasse. Um, it seems to be more and more clear, and I can't really see how so many MPs will now come out to say that they are not going to support the Prime Minister's deal and can now go back on their word. And it seems that the Prime Minister will struggle to get a majority for her deal. So what's the next thing? MPs have also, and I'm, I'm absolutely convinced for that, are clear in the majority that they do not support a no deal. And indeed, Hilary Benn is trying to, to get a cross-party group of MPs to support an amendment for no deal. So we don't have this deal, 
we don't have no deal. Then there are further options of a general election, which is um, the favorite option for the Labour Party currently. Um, there's also the option, and there would be possibly some support for actually coming out to say we stay in the single market and the customs union. And then there is, of course, the people's vote. Currently, there is no majority for a people's vote either, so we still have work to do. But I believe the people's vote will come on the table when all other options are off the table. The people's vote is that option. Um, and I am absolutely amazed to see how the momentum is growing for a people's vote. And the work that everybody has done on the ground has definitely helped a great deal with that. But I don't believe if the vote would be tomorrow that we would get a majority for a people's vote. And we need to be very realistic about that. But the momentum is growing every day. I think the, the chances for a people's vote are coming closer. And with the chance of a people's vote, um, the chance for a no Brexit outcome. And that's, of course, what why I'm here. That is, I think, um, what um, all four of us here on the platform are campaigning for. That's what I assume most of you in the audience are passionately believing in as well. So let's hear it today for the European Union, because if we do have a people's vote, then, of course, the big work has to be done to, to, to really get a passionate majority of people to believe that the best place that we have is actually within the European Union. Over to our speakers. Thank you very much. And uh, as has been said, my intention is not to speak for too long so that uh, we can pass the floor over to you and you can challenge us. Um, there's also a great danger that with the three of us, we're all going to be saying very similar things because uh, on this issue at least, <laughs> it's, uh, we are united in believing that Brexit is a really bad idea for our country. It's... <laughs> uh, and yes, I obviously believe that in the referendum campaign, I, you know, campaign hard all across the southwest and in Gibraltar, part of our region as well, uh, for the Remain side on, for that referendum on 23rd of June. And of course passionately believed in us staying in the EU since then. But even, even I, who do the European Union for a living, have learned so much <laughs> since that referendum campaign. I've learned, I have a much deeper understanding now of so many other different areas than the ones I focus on, of why it is that we desperately ought to be staying in the European Union for the good of our country. I'm quickly going to highlight two areas that uh, I think it's really important that we talk about. One of them is inevitably people. It's about all the European Union citizens that live here in the UK. And it is also about those British citizens that live in the rest of the European Union. There is not a piece of our life, a part of our life, where there are people from other European countries that are working or supporting our lives in the UK. And that's been enabled because of freedom of movement. And we should be passionately sticking up for that freedom of movement. Mm. If you look at our NHS, there used, to, there used to be a thousand nurses a month would come and work in the NHS be, from the European Union. That is now down to 100 a month. We have lost 90% of those people coming. And if you talk to anyone who works in the NHS, you know the staffing shortages that are going on in our health service. And a lot of that is down to the fact not only that people are no longer coming here in the numbers that they used to come, as I say, to support our public services, to, uh, to work alongside people in all sorts of areas, sectors. But it is also because those European citizens that are here have faced some pretty abhorrent reactions from some of the people, from some part sections of our uh, society, and obviously from our media and the way that some of that campaigning was done as well. 
So that whole atmosphere of you're not welcome has been toxic for us as a society in my mind. And we really need to start facing that down and start challenging that view of who we are as a country and the, uh, the way that we behave. So citizens is one area, and I could wax lyrical about that for a long time. Another area that I've worked on uh, since I've been elected is that of research. And the links that go on between this country and our EU, uh, our other EU member states, are really deep in the field of research. And we get such mutual benefit for being part of what is the largest research programme in the world. It's called currently Horizon 2020. The next programme, which will start at the beginning of 2021, is called Horizon Europe. And that programme, at, probably at the minimum, will involve, over seven years, 100 billion euros of investment in research and innovation. And we're going to be a third country, according to Theresa May. We're not going to be doing what we do now. Leading projects, being a net beneficiary, you know, boxing and coxing with Germany as to which country gets the most uh, advantage from this research programme, supporting all of our universities that can take part in this, the Erasmus programme that provides exchanges of students as well. All of that, we've been able to take for granted with the Horizon 2020 programme is the eighth research programme. Horizon Europe will be the ninth. Up until now, it's been seamless and unthinking. Third country status means that even if we do pay to be in it, and we will have to pay to be in it, and we will not be able to get any more than we put in, and that will be calculated, we won't be able to take the leading role that we have been doing up until now. So it is, you know, it is a tragic loss for this country, which I have to tell you is lagging behind. It's at the bottom of the league tables inside the OECD for research and innovation investment in any case. We currently invest a little over 1.6% in, in uh, R&D. The average that should be aimed for is 3%. And guess what? Leaving Europe is going to make it harder than ever for us to build up to that 3%. So I promise not to talk too long. I've probably talked over my five minutes already. I'm looking forward to the questions and answers. But I would just say in conclusion, the thing that has happened, that has trans changed the backdrop to everything now is that the deal that May has done is written down. And as soon as anything was written down, it was always going to become transparent that it couldn't meet the promises that the leavers made in all of that campaign and all that time up to now. Nothing that gets written down it was going to survive the scrutiny uh, and matching up against those, the rhetoric of the promised unicorns and pots of gold at the ends of rainbow that we all heard and uh, had to face down in the campaign and ever since. So now we have the text, we also have hope. And let's build on that and campaign for our future to be in the European Union. So I haven't come here to make a campaign speech. I think the most useful thing I can do is to make it clear how we see what's happening with Brexit from the European side. Because every time I come back to the UK, and actually I listen to UK media when I'm in Brussels, there's an unbelievable amount of guff and myth-making and just pure nonsense being spouted. So I'm going to try and tell you in my 10 minutes how it looks to me, and then in the questions and answers, let's try and develop that a little bit further. So I'm going to have to point to my glamorous assistant behind the curtain here, so that may look a little bit weird, but hopefully we'll manage. So basically this is what I'm going to run through. I'm going to talk a little bit about trade, a bit about the economic impacts, and also about how 
the power shift is working with Brexit? Because I think the important question that we all need to ask is who's taking back control from whom? And finally, I'll talk a little bit about what you can do. I know you know about that because you're doing that already. So, the really important thing to say at the beginning is this was always portrayed dishonestly in Britain. This was never going to be this amazing showdown between these two guys here. You know, in the UK it was always portrayed as this poker game, we're not going to show you our hand, you know, we're going to take back control, we're going to reclaim this global role. This was always a fantasy. The cards were always in the hands of the European Union, the treaties are written that way, Article 50 is written that way, and that's why in fact, Davis backed down right at the beginning and, and both he and Dominic Raab were utter failures because they could never have had the power to do what they were trying to do. There was never this option on the table of cake, it, cake and eat it. There were always the binary options. Do you want the Norway type deal? Do you want the Canada type deal? And it was always obvious that we were leaving this powerful bloc and it was going to be much more powerful in the negotiations than we were. So, a little bit about the withdrawal agreement. The most important thing of all to grasp about this agreement is it's not about our future. It's just about getting out of the European Union. So it's about how we leave and it's about the fact that we'll have two years to prepare for our future relationship with the EU. The bit, that's 585 pages. The bit that's about the future relationship is only 26 pages long and none of it is legally binding. During the time that we're negotiating, we will have to abide by all the EU rules, but we won't, you won't have anybody like us influencing those rules. Nadine Dorries worked that out last week and said, what well, a scandal it was that she wouldn't have MEPs representing her during the transition. What a pity she didn't look into this previously. But at least she knew that we were quite close to France and a lot of our trade went across the channel. Or, or perhaps she just didn't admit that she didn't know that. Okay, so, you know, what kind of impact is that going to have on Bath? We know that the impacts nationally of any type of Brexit that we can go through makes us poorer. The, the figures are very clear about that. But what type of impact will it have on Bath? Well, we've seen for the South West as a whole, there could be a drop of as much as 5% if we end up in the no deal scenario. As Vera said, actually that's not going to happen, but that's the worst possible impact. But actually, as Claire pointed out, Universities are very important to a lot of the cities in the southwest, including Bath, and about 6% of our students come from the EU. They're now going to have to pay twice as much in future to come here. A lot of them will choose to go elsewhere. We have a lot of young people coming for Erasmus. Of course, our young people may not be able to go on Erasmus visits themselves, and it's not just about university, actually. All young people are now available to go through various Erasmus schemes, and that's so important in terms of understanding our place within this European continent. And we're going to see as well an important impact in, in terms of tourism, not just because it'll be more expensive for Europeans to come here because we'll have some kind of presumably reciprocal visa system, but also because so many of the people that work in our tourism sector at present and hospitality generally are EU citizens. So, right, I'll just spend a little bit of time on trade. This is like where it enters basically a sort of blackadder world of, of utter fantasy, in my view. That's why I have uh, Francis Drake here. Obviously, I'd be his MEP as well if he was still alive, as we all would. Um, but this is, you know, this swashbuckling fantasy of suddenly going out onto the high seas like some kind of privateer. It's a complete absurdity. It was never going to happen. What we will be doing, in effect, is swapping our place in a major trading block of 500 million people for, to become a country of 65 million people. And in trade, size really matters. And the, the thought that somehow it will be easier negotiating with the 163 members of the WTO compared to the 27 members of the EU is just completely unrealistic, particularly when you bear in mind that there's countries there like Argentina, and we're not obviously the, the favourite country there. So, and, and more to the point, we are now leaping into this unknown, right in the middle of a trade war launched by Trump, and somehow the Brexiteers will try and persuade you that, that the answer is to fall into the arms of Donald Trump. Of course, Donald Trump was not in the White House when people voted for Brexit. It completely changes the complexion of what we're doing in terms of our global trading relationship. Fox is now suggesting that we might go into this Trans-Pacific Partnership. When I first saw that, I thought it was a spoof account. Because I thought he hadn't, I mean, we know Dominic Raab doesn't know where we are, but I really didn't think Fox thought we were somewhere in the Pacific. But apparently this is our trading future now. I realised though that actually the, the mutineers from the Bounty, when they went off in their little boat, they ended up in Pitcairn Island, in the middle of the Pacific. So 
perhaps that's got, what he's got in mind. And you know, people that couldn't abide by other people's rules ended up on a bleak island. Could be there's something about Brexit in that. Um, but this is the most disturbing aspect is how this is not prepared for at all. I had a long conversation with a cheese farmer in Somerset who said to me, I export my cheese under the rules of the deals that the EU has with other countries. There is nothing to replace that and those arrangements will come to an end in March next year. He has no idea how he will be able to export his cheese to Korea or to, to South Africa after March next year. I wrote, well, we, we wrote a joint letter actually to Liam Fox saying, what, what plans have you got for this? He didn't reply. He said in public that actually, oh, these countries will just roll over the deals. It's a wing and a prayer and they haven't done that and there's no sign that they're going to do that. And in terms of the WTO, as soon as the EU suggested just sharing our schedules and quotas fairly, other countries that are competitive with us challenged that. They said we wouldn't give the same terms to the UK as we give to the EU. Of course they wouldn't because we're a tenth the size, we have a tenth the power in those negotiations. Exports, our biggest export sector by far is services, not just financial services, legal services, education, all sorts of other professional skills that we currently export right across the world. Very few trade deals actually cover those kinds of services. So again, we'll be having to pay tariffs as we export these services and that will make us uncompetitive. But the most important point of all is that we don't know anything about what our trading relationships will look like after Brexit. This is purely provisional and nothing is legally binding, which is why it becomes important when we look at who's actually driving this. I just go take a little detail around this ridiculous tweet from Priti Patel in which she says, you know, oh, it's no longer about how great Brexit is going to be, it's just about the fact that we have to do it. And this reminds me of that speech in the House of Lords, I can't remember the name of the Lord now, but he said, you know, this is like his aunt's make a decision to go to the cinema. And as he's walking home past the cinema, he sees that the film showing is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But when he gets home, you know, he says to his aunts, well, you've got to go and see that because you decided earlier that you were going to go to the cinema. This is the kind of crazy situation we're in now. Nobody believes that Brexit's actually better for us, but it's like, well, people decided to vote for that in June 2016, so no matter how much damage will be done, we have to go ahead with it. The sunlit uplands have now evaporated. It's just our duty to carry through with this one democratic decision made at one point. A democracy that cannot change its mind ceases to be a democracy, said David Davis in A Former Life. <laughs> so this is the really important point when we've got to ask who is driving Brexit, who is benefiting from Brexit. We looked into that in my office and the, the website we came up with is here, it's called The Bad Boys of Brexit and there they are. There is one bad girl, Liz Bilney, who's now under investigation by the the National Crime Office, but anyway, she, she's got a special page now, which she didn't have when I made this slide. So essentially there's three bunches of people. There's money men who don't want to pay taxes, don't like the sort of work I do in the European Parliament, making sure rich people pay their taxes, and also people who are gambling on a hard Brexit, as we'll see in a minute. Then we've got the regulation burners, people who just don't like the fact that we, as citizens, can have power over what they do with their businesses. They want to be free to pollute, to have low standards of hygiene, to have appalling ways of treating animals on farms, whatever. They don't want us in our committees controlling what they do. They want to roll back the democratic powers that have been used to contain their worst behaviour. And then we have the Russian connection, which again I think we're coming on to in a minute. So here's what the gamblers are actually up to. On the night of the referendum, Nigel Farage came out and said they'd lost. He'd already seen private polling showing that they'd won. The reason he did that was the pound then dropped dramatically. At that point, various cronies of his took positions on the pound and they made a fortune out of that bet, betting against us, betting against the national economy. Chris Binodi, oh, he's a pretty odious looking guy, but we haven't got a picture of him here. Here's what he said the morning after the referendum. I feel fantastic. It's a fantastic decision by the electorate. And then he also said, I feel as if my mouth was stuffed with gold. Yes, 220 million pounds worth of gold he had made by gambling against the pound. And he now has a major bet against British companies and against the pound if we actually leave um, in a disorderly way. These are the disaster capitalists who are driving us towards the hardest form of Brexit because they can profit from it. By the way, please have a look at this website, but don't look in the evening because quite a few people have told me it's kept them awake, so have a look at the last time or something. Um, we now know that the, the Leave side, both campaigns on the Leave side were guilty of criminal activity, fraud, 
overspending, breaking electoral law. It's not allegations and it's not cheating, it's law breaking. And this in itself is enough to validate, invalidate the referendum result. So uh, at, this po at the point I wrote this article, I think six members of the cabinet were on the board of vote leave, and I say in this, argument, um, in this article that they should all be sacked. Actually, I asked for two of them to be sacked, but the Guardian got back to me and said, why not go for the whole six? So I did. <laughs> um, the, the two frontmen, Boris Johnson and Michael Gove, they were the ones you know, driving this. Um, Steve Baker was the guy who worked out the fraud by which you could spend an endless amount and break electoral law. Okay. Um, the Russian connection, we know even less about this, although we're finding out through the back door, through the Mueller investigation in the US, and what's becoming clear is the way that various extremely wealthy and powerful men across the world are working to undermine democracy. Trump is a part of that, Brexit is a part of that. It's obviously secret activity and it's kind of spook type activity, so it's really hard to get a clear picture. We can be sure that our security services know quite a lot about this, but they're not saying. In my view, we shouldn't be able to go ahead with Brexit until we're very clear which foreign powers and which foreign money influenced the outcome of the referendum. This is the next website we set up, which is about what these guys are doing behind the scenes now to change our life in future. We've called them the Brexit Syndicate. Powerful players like Cambridge Analytica, like the Institute for Economic Affairs that you may have heard again on the BBC this morning, secretly funded from the US. Their objective is to get control of the National Health Service for their private health corporations and to, to, to basically make sure that we go down a path that's much closer to the US and we lose the sort of protections that the EU offers us. So what can you do? I'm sure you're doing this already. I'm sure you're out there with your Brexitometers. I know that you are tremendously active as Bath for Europe. And um, on the next slide, I think, I know you're campaigning for a people's vote already. Some of you hopefully in that photograph. Um, I'm sure you've been busy with the petition. You don't really need to keep pressure on your MP because she's on your side already. If you don't live in Vera's constituency, please keep sending those cards and letters in. We're really making a difference through the pressure we're putting on MPs. I'm writing to all the MEPs in the southwest at the minute with personal letters asking them to do the right thing. The decision will be made in Parliament on the 11th of December, so I think we can anticipate that we'll all be there kind of making a noise around the time that happens. So just to finish, thank you so much for what you're doing. I completely agree with what Vera says. We can still stop this. We have to stop this. Thank you for everything you're doing to make that happen. You've obviously um, really put a lot of effort and research into um, finding the arguments that really back up why it is so important we continue to fight. Um, yeah, it was sort of European 10 minutes, I'd say, a little bit longer. Um, but um, let's hand over now to Julie. Thank you. Thanks. Well, we, before we came this evening, we didn't have a great deal of time to decide how we were going to deal with it, and we sort of divided some topics up, but I, I think I'll throw that away, because uh, I can, judging from your uh, response to my colleagues, uh, there's little point in me telling you more about the problems of Brexit, because I think you're all pretty well aware of that, and if there are any particular issues, please bring them up in questions. But maybe I could use my five minutes usefully telling you what's been happening Brussels over the last week or two. Because it's very, very clear that the action has now moved from Brussels to Westminster. Um, but we have had a fairly frenetic couple of weeks, and if I just explain exactly what's happened. So, as of Sunday, as you know, the deal is done, uh, and it has to be ratified by the UK Parliament. It also has to be voted for by the, the European Parliament. And I know from a lot of colleagues who are fighting Brexit that there's been some hope that that would not happen and the European Parliament would be the last bastion of it won't be. Uh, I need to tell you that the European Parliament will vote for this deal. That is absolutely clear. It doesn't mean the three of us up here will, uh, but the other 750 odd, I would imagine it will be at least 
613 for the deal. So that, that isn't going to save us. Uh, however, the European Union actor in all of this does have a strong role. And one of the things that we're doing is trying to persuade the political groups within the European Parliament to leave the door open for the people's vote. Because Mrs May said yesterday in the Select Committee that uh, it, it would be impossible to go back to the European Union for another deal. In that, I agree with her. But she also implied, actually she said, that this deal would be off the table if the British Parliament didn't vote for it on the 11th. That is not actually true. Um, it is, as far as uh, the EU27 are concerned, the only deal around, but it's not going anywhere. And I think we've pretty much secured support from across the board politically in Europe that they, will, they won't withdraw it summarily and basically dump it in a no-deal scenario. But what they're absolutely clear that they will not do is extend Article 50, which frankly almost all options for a people's vote would require. What they're absolutely clear they won't do is extend that Article 50 just for us to faff about a bit more. And they're very, they are very scathing about that. I mean, one of the real downsides of what's happened over the last couple of years is our political capital is now worth nothing in Europe. Um, people have gone from being sympathetic to just disbelieving us, just sort of shaking your heads and what the hell is going on? We always looked up to you. I think we can recover that, but at the moment we're at an absolute uh, bottom of the trough with that. So what they will not do is give us more time to muck them about, I mean, putting it simply. So what we have to have are two things, I think. We have to have the end of the line on the deal, in other words, if Mrs May comes for a second vote, that also has to go down. And we all have a role in that, and no doubt we'll talk about that during the questions. The tactics for the, for the for getting a people's vote are really important. But Europe will leave that door open, but you will hear some quite hard line positions. Saying, for example, no, no, we, you know, this is it, this is all it is, we will not move. The one thing that they will move, I believe, and I think uh, my colleagues will agree, is that they will move to allow for a people's vote, so long as there is remain as an option on the ballot paper. They're not going to give us a vote, which, well, it's not up to them, but they're not going to give us any room to establish a people's vote between no deal and this deal. We would have to have a remain option. And what they will do is allow us some flexibility, but they, I haven't found anyone who will allow us that flexibility beyond the 23rd of May. Because the 23rd of May are the European elections. And we are not currently geared up to fight them. Although, as I think we saw in the press, there has been a bit of money put aside by government, but in all, in all to all intents and purposes, we're not having those European elections. So we would we would struggle to fight an election, I think, in the febrile conditions that we currently have. So I don't think it's in anyone's interest to say that we should <coughs> suspend Article 50 beyond the 23rd of May and have European elections whilst we're in that process. So we really do need to sort it by then, which means we have to get tough, ladies and gentlemen. The problem is that uh, the Leave side are the nasties, the bad boys, you know, this is all true. And we're the really thoroughly nice people. You know, we're all, as, as you know, somebody called our march at the longest way trade's queue in the street. <laughs> we, we have to make sure that, that it isn't, I'm not suggesting, I'm not asking you to go out and, you know, civil dis disobedience, but we have to get nasty and we have to fight fire with fire. And we have to, we have to realize, we have a, we have a matter of days, really, mm -hmm. to sort this. So we we have to take the gloves off, and, and with our MPs particularly, they have to understand that. Because one thing I've learned, um, or with all due respect to Vera, is Westminster MPs are interested in one thing only first, and that's what happens to me. And. That's what happens to me, do I keep my seat or do I lose it, is the first thing. So the thing they do not want is a general election. 
because all of them are in danger then, so they don't want a general election. So we can't hope. <laughs> well, I did say not because I don't know Camilla very well, but she's a very unusual lady if she doesn't fall into these categories, which I'm sure, I'm sure she does. So they, they don't, they, they want to know what's going to happen to them. So we need to make sure that they all understand that what happens to them if they vote for this deal is exactly what they don't want to happen, is they will not be re elected. And whichever constituency you're in, uh, obviously here in the southwest, especially the Tories. Well, I know a bit about Tories, and I can tell you that they that is that is their first thought, and they many of them think they're unsaleable because they have very good majorities, but they absolutely ignore uh, the, what is now more than fifty percent of their constituents at their peril, and we need to mobilise those people to tell them that in, in pretty short order. So anyway, I'm going into campaign speech and I'm not going to do that, but I just wanted to set out what the situation is in Brussels. Still there to help, but they're running out of patience fast and we really need to, uh, to get on with showing that we actually do have a plan and that we can deliver. So, um, thank you for listening and I look forward to, uh, to the questions. points of views um, from all three of you. We're having um, a break now and then we come back at eight o'clock. I just want to, to say one thing from my perspective about being nasty. What, um, what uh, polls showed before we went into the um, 2016 elections is 30% of people who are ardent leavers. You know, they've been waiting for this moment for such a long time. And 25 to 30% were passionate pro-Europeans and then 40% somewhere in the middle. And actually, if you look at numbers now, things haven't really changed. There continues to be 30 to 35% of other people who want to leave the European Union. And those people haven't gone away. Um, but And when we're talking about the split in the country, um, those are because they're very vociferous, and you're absolutely right, they're the, the vociferous minority, they are a minority, but they are the people who are frightening every um, politician now in Westminster that we are ending up um, with a very, very split country, although we're already a very split country, if we are going to have another people's vote. And I think uh, in, in our arguments when we are campaigning for a people's vote, we need to take that into account. There will be, there will be, there's the 30% of people, and that's a lot of people, who will be very, very angry about a people's vote, or, or if it came to that, that we have a no Brexit outcome. We have to deal with that as a country, we have to deal with that as campaigners, um, and go into these things open-eyed, because I think one of the things that was, was really not the case in 2016, that people didn't go into the, into the referendum with open eyes. I love this country. I think we are having it out now. I think in a lot of European countries, um, the same discuss discussions are raging. It's unfortunate that these open discussions weren't had before we had the, the, the referendum. We are having it now. I strongly and passionately believe in, in, in this country, in the ultimately sort of rationality of what people think. I believe in people. I believe we can turn that around. I believe in this country. I think it's a passionate thing to do. But I, I see you at, uh, at eight o'clock again and then we're taking uh, questions. The first questions, please, hands up. Yes, can we have um, you at the front here? Um, uh, uh, on the, on the left hand side of the two guys, sorry, um, in, in the middle there, and, and where have we got another hand up, and at the back there, okay? Right, ask your question. Yes, I want to know what we can do. Can you just introduce yourself with your name? Yes, so I'm, my name is Pip Hickman. Um, I've lived in Germany for 43 years before coming back to Britain. Just, I feel I'm a European. <laughs> So what are the questions going to be on the ballot for the people's vote? Okay. And this, uh, and this uh, over there, yeah, please. Yep. What, what? You. Yeah. I don't know if you ask the, the guy, the, 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 the... <laughs> yeah. Um, so I have a question for Claire. Um, there seems to be a significant difference in opinion to a people's vote between Jeremy Corbyn and members of the Shadow Cabinet, especially the Shadow Brexit Secretary. 
And uh, given that the vast majority of Labour members would support a people's vote, when will we get a clear answer from the Labour leadership as to whether Labour will push for a people's vote or not? Sorry, my name's Sharon. Sorry? Sharon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Richard Carter. Why is there so little exposure of the illegality of the referendums? I mean, principally in the observer, the wonderful Carol Cadwallader. Um, is it simply because most of the other newspapers are owned by very rich people? And why has the BBC not been uh, exposing this illegality at all? Okay, can we maybe start because um, we haven't heard from you, Claire, for a while. So, Claire, if you take the question that was actually directed to you directly. Yeah, I think I'm pretty unworried about the which question I get. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. I right. First off, um, I have been a little further out there than my, uh, in fact, my party and my leadership for a lot longer. Uh, in that, uh, as I say, I consistently thought this was a spectacular and bad idea. Uh, but actually, my party's position has shifted a lot. So we saw that at conference, and your point is spot on in terms of where the party membership is. You know, party membership, party voters, and the voters for Labour MPs who are even in leave seats, even before we're seeing the shifts that we're seeing now in the polls, those leave seats, Labour leave seats, still a majority of the leave vote, sorry, the Labour voters were remain voters. So you know, there's, a, there's quite a lot of mythology, but actually if you dig into the numbers, you know, there's uh, a very clear remain constituency remain voters for Labour, and now uh, yeah, kind of the, the polling of our membership is absolutely crystal clear, and it's about 80% remain uh, inside of the membership. And it goes to Julie's point as well, because this is actually quite helpful for with some of our uh, MPs in, and their, um, their job security, <laughs> is that if the, the numbers are now becoming quite stark in terms of uh, the benefit to us as a party if we take a much stronger remain line for not just keeping the MPs that we've got, but actually in the marginal seats as well and picking up seats too. And there's some analysis done around uh, about uh, you know, some of the gains we made in 2017. So coming to the leadership, right? Well, party conference, our conference policy, unanimously supported, uh, was is that yeah we to test the deal against our six tests, all of which were made by uh, promises made at the dispatch box by cabinet ministers, <coughs> including David Davis saying that whatever we get, we will have no less, you know, the terms will be no less than the ones we have currently. So we're holding them to account on that. Not very surprisingly, Theresa May's deal is not gonna meet that test. We will be voting against, exactly as policy said. There is then having a general election, <coughs> I think the reality is a general election is not an option that's going to be on the ballot. It's not going to be an option because it relies on the government wanting a general election and they really don't want a general election. So it is now a people's vote. And that John McDonald confirmed this week, you know, party conference policy, unanimously supported. John McDonald said this week that a people's vote is the inevitable step for us. And that's absolutely where we're going to get to. So uh, it's, it's taken a lot longer than I would have wanted it to take. I promise you that. And there's been a lot of work done behind the scenes by all sorts of really good people, trade unionists, membership activists, all the rest of it. Uh, and you know, I'm convinced that we are you know, now going to enact party policy, which is now going to lead to the Labour Party actively supporting in the House the, uh, the people's best option. <laughs> Thank you. So, Julie, said... <laughs> <laughs> Rob, your question. Yeah. Uh, certainly, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my view on what's going to be on the ballot paper. 
Um, I, I'm very clear, uh, I'm very concerned about some of the debate about the ballot paper and three-way options. Um, I don't want a three-way option. I don't want a single transferable vote option. I don't want a presidential election style option where we have two referendums a, a, a week apart on a 50% threshold basis. I want a simple choice. I don't think we are, are good at uh, preference elections. Maybe we should be, because one thing uh, Brexit's turning into is much more of a proportional representation plan, but that's for later. This is, this is more important. And uh, we don't have much experience. I think only the PCC campaign will be in this area and look how that went. And the PC, uh, Police and Crime Commission has it's not been a, it, it's not been a success, and that's partly because of the election system for it. So let's have a simple question. Now, the other issue, of course, is that we have this terrible complication of how long it takes to get together a referendum. And I spoke already about the time frame that we need to be thinking about. So part of this 10 week part of that process that's about talking about the question, it's about consulting on the question, it's about um, approving the question. We could truncate that to zero weeks by just using the same question. And I believe that's the only way we're ever going to get this vote, is we have to use the same question that we used before. Do you want to stay or do you want to go? We just have to work out what, what option we go. It's what Parliament are going to deliver that for us, because they're going to reject this deal, let's hope. But if they don't, then it's, it's, it's actually still the option. The only option to me that will be there is going with no deal, because that will be the only option that the EU are going to give us. They told us it's this deal, or there's no deal. So if Parliament reject this deal, then it is no deal. So leaving is on the basis of no deal. Staying is what? Well, staying is staying. Um, if Parliament do vote for this deal, I think there's a tougher call to get the people's vote. It's not impossible, and I'm not giving up. But what you'll be voting on then is the deal that Parliament have voted for or remaining. And the wording that we had in the last referendum works extremely well for that simple binary choice. And I don't think we have either the time or the ability to change it. I think we'd all like to sit around and talk about what the three things Forget it. We just need to get on with this, and the simplest ways is to do that. Thank you, Julie. Thank you very much. I mean, of course, people are not going to agree on that. One thing that I say to everybody, Let's not use the word remain. Yeah. Yeah. Who talks about remain? Why don't we talk about stay? Okay. Because yeah. it gives us a different idea that the that the, yeah. the question that we are asking is yeah. a slightly different question. Yeah. Stay yeah. in the EU. Yes. Stay in the EU. Yeah. No. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. My point being that you use the same question. It uses the word remain. Okay. So you go off on that tangent. You're not going to get it. All right. Okay. 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 Exactly the same. All right. Interesting. <laughs> So I will come to, to Sharon's question about Labour first because I think you're completely right. It's it's really all about Labour and this does make me a bit nervous. I wish I was as confident as Claire. Um, I think the saddest thing about some Labour people who are still thinking we should support Brexit is it's their very voters who will lose out most here. Um, I hope Claire's right. I mean, we've all got to push very hard to make sure she is right and there's no backsliding, but I'm afraid there are some people right at the top of the Labour Party who actually, um, in their hearts, want Brexit to happen for various reasons. Question on the ballot paper. Because we're amongst friends, I'll give you my view, which is slightly different to Julie's view. I agree with her it needs to be a binary choice, but my view is you shouldn't have given electorate the ability to choose something that's actually impossible or unconscionable. A no deal is totally unconscionable. It will lead to civil unrest, lack of food, shortage of insulin. We are not prepared for no deal. Yeah. And therefore, I think we should have a choice between two real options, May's deal or staying in the EU. The problem is, as Julie points out, that Parliament will have already said that we reject May's deal. But as she also pointed out, the deal is still there. It, it, that deal will continue to be available until March the 29th. So if you want to come back and reconsider it, I think that's a possibility. Anyway, you will have perceived by now that the People's Vote is not entirely clear about this, which I think we need to be within a, yes, within a very short time frame. Um, then Richard's question, why is the corruption being covered up? For the same reason corruption is covered up in all places and all times, because the rich and powerful want it to be covered up. 
And that is the most disturbing thing of all that Brexit has revealed. And as you point out, the Brexit syndicate website, a third of the people on there are media outlets or owners of media outlets. So people talk a lot about free speech. We don't have free speech. Most of our opinions and the news we read are bought and paid for by the rich and powerful. And that's been revealed very starkly through this Brexit debate. And I think one of the things that really astonished me is how rapidly the quality of our democracy has been undermined deliberately by people who wanted to make Brexit happen during the referendum, by ignorance and uh, oversight by, by organisations like Facebook and other media outlets, and just because we didn't have the checks and balances we thought we had and we hadn't kept our democracy up to date since it was sort of designed somewhere back in the 18th century. So I'm really delighted to hear Julie's been converted to PR, but I think Possibly. But one of the things I think we need to absolutely make sure happens whether we go ahead with Brexit or not is major political and constitutional reform. I think it needs to be our top demand. And I would say certainly a fair voting system, definitely a written constitution. So we can't have Prime Minister sort of coming in and willy-nilly, carelessly starting us down these appalling routes with sort of half-hearted decisions to have no voting. The third point is the importance of having a democratic second chamber because the Lords has been much more rational in dealing with Brexit than the Commons, but they haven't had the courage to push that through because they don't have any democratic authority. So that's my, my third, on, on my Christmas list, that's the third constitutional reform. And on that, I'm A next round of questions, please. Uh, where's the microphone? Uh, so can you go around uh, at the front here, um, uh, um, Alice at the back, and who else have we? Oh, and um, this gentleman now to the, the person who spoke previously. Yeah. My name is Chris Hickman. Um, I have a score of figures to answer the question, what has Europe done for me? But I'll just concentrate on one. A year ago I had a heart attack. I was very well treated, nursed in the IUH by Portuguese, by Romanian, oh. by uh, uh, Polish nurses. Uh, it was all covered by my German EHIC card, so that was absolutely no problem. I've read as much as I can of those 585 pages. If you put in the word health, it's in there about 20 times, uh, 18 times animal health, once uh, uh, plant health, but once a reference to the EHIC card, which will be retained, will retain its validity for those citizens of other European countries in Britain or for British citizens in other parts of the European Union. But for the rest of us, on the 29th of March, it looked to my reading as though our EHIC cards were going to be invalidated. This morning, I spoke with Michelle Donnellan, who was in Chippenham, our uh, Conservative MP, she confirmed that and found that it was a good thing. So my question is, how could we use this kind of information to get our point of view across? Hello, I'm Alice Hovanesian. I'm just um, wondering um, if you could just outline some of the ways you think we should be um, convincing or letting people know the benefits of job being part of the European Union, because that's something that we haven't been uh, maybe doing enough of for, for a long time. And how do we get those that message across, would you suggest? Hi, my name is Mark. Um, on the day of the results of the referendum, I was 17. I wasn't living in the UK. I was quite politically unaware of the vulnerability of the UK with regards to the referendum. And I was almost unaware of um, the wider implications that would be brought about just because it wasn't really talked about. And I was, it was only on the morning of the referendum that I, I realized what implications it would have for my country. Um, as an Irish national, I feel as though when I'm looking back to the, the conversations around the referendum, there was absolutely no mention of the Good Friday agreements and how it would be completely violated. There was... Um, 
so, so there was no discussion around what the wider political implications uh, would, would be around on top of that. I would also noticed that the referendum was driven by not having an argument. Just think the tech doctor in the house. Um, <laughs> Sorry, and that's why the drum is so cool. Non factual arguments. And that's why I do think that for the people that are second, uh, second referendum, it should be. In order, but I'm going to be honest. I I, I, I do fear uh, the implications that would come from a people's vote, just because there's a huge degree of uncertainty uh, around what the government will look like after uh, in the next few months. What the deal currently implies. I mean, I think it's fair to say that the deal that Theresa May is currently negotiating is has been negotiated in such a way that it was supposed to get to get the lowest minimum impact economically. Economically speaking, and I'm afraid that if there is a people's vote and and people vote against uh, staying in the EU, then there would be the hardline Brexiteers that would eventually come into power and would reach out to a no deal Brexit, which would have not only hard implications for the UK but also for my country. So I'm asking all of you on the panel: Are you? Do you, like when you're making your decisions on on what you're proposing or what you're going for in, in the next in the next vote of parliament, what are you are you considering that? Is it something that you're afraid of, or have you already thought about it? Okay, so um, this one is also dead now. We uh, all need to shout. Oh, that's working excellent. So, um, who wants to take the first question from the line? Yeah. I'll start off with um, Mark and the Irish question. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. I was completely ashamed of the way this country totally ignored the very close relationship between ourselves and Ireland. And given the history that we've got of repeatedly shafting Ireland, I think it was an utter disgrace that that was not discussed more during the referendum. It's not just about the Northern Ireland agreement, although that is deathly serious, really serious business. It's also about the, the way that we've had the, the free travel area, it's the way we've had such strong um, economic relationships going back centuries, actually. And um, Claire and I actually shared a platform in Bournemouth a couple of days before the referendum, which sticks in our minds because it was such a horrendous experience. And the MP there, Connor Burns, is from Ulster. And, uh, he, you know, one of us, I don't remember which one, raised this question of Northern Ireland, and he and his booming tones, you know, said how this was just no issue at all, and there was nothing to be concerned with, and it was Project Fear. And he then became Boris Johnson's private secretary, actually. So, you know, he was rewarded for, for telling these lies and for just undermining this issue that is of such fundamental importance. So, I mean, I find myself apologising all the time to Irish people, who obviously we meet a lot in our work in the European Parliament. To be honest with you, Ireland as a country now has a great deal of confidence and um, will suffer, I believe, a lot less than, than the UK if Brexit happens. But the most important thing is this is another very important reason to make sure that we do stop Brexit. I think I've already made clear your question around what happens next. I find it very difficult to contemplate that because I think we will be in um, we will be in a very weak position as citizens because the people who are taking power in this situation do not have regard for democratic standards. I think they've already proved that. Somebody else can do the hit card, although I could. Uh, I just wanted to say about the, the positive messages. Surely people know more now about what the European Union does for them because they've seen what they can lose. I spoke in Devizes recently with um, Lord Adonis and there was a Remainer Inn guy there and he said that, you know, he was promised a lot of things in the referendum but nobody told him what he was going to lose. People know very clearly now what they're going to lose and I think we ran a campaign during the first referendum which was called South West Greener Inn, it was only positive and if we get this people's vote that's what we're going to have to do next time, just sell the positive messages and I think our theme song should be Joni Mitchell, Big Yellow Taxi, you don't know what it's got to lose. You don't know what you've got to lose. <laughs> Maybe I can just follow up on that one. Um, I agree, we need to have a very positive campaign about the benefits of being in the European Union, but uh, that will only appeal to some of the people that we need to vote for us. And I think what we're going to have to get our heads around is that it's not going to be one cohesive campaign with two or three big messages. 
it's going to have to be a number of campaigns because we just established, I absolutely agree with Vera's analysis that you know, there's about 30% of people out there who will never vote to remain in the European Union. They, it doesn't matter what you say to them, they're absolutely sure that it's all a dreadful conspiracy and their lives are complete hell because of the European Union. And you, you won't change that. And then you've got people, I guess, like most of us, who are pretty much on the other end of that, and it's the people in the middle. And they're, they're not the, all the same people. And some of them are going to respond really well to the positive messages of unity, of uh, human rights, of the rights to, to roam. Some of them will respond to single issues, like, you know, you can keep your no roaming charges on your telephone. Um, because that, if you, some of the analysis of why people voted in the last one, it came down to very simple, sim simple issues. So there would have to be a, a sort of hearts and mind campaign on that basis. But also, I do think, um, maybe I, perhaps I differ from Molly here because she talks about the Green campaign being fully positive. I think we have to get a bit nasty and um, I, I don't think we necessarily have to have every single message we have would stack up. Um, if we were to sit around as the very civilised people we are over dinner and, and analyse whether it's all absolutely true. I'm not suggesting we lie, but what I am saying is that if you think about the way in which the Leave campaign had posters saying that 80 million Turks were going to come over on the country effectively. Now, of course, they now say, oh, we didn't say that. No, I didn't even look at the words. No, they actually quite carefully didn't actually say that. They bloody well imply it. So we have to reverse that tactic, I'm afraid. Uh, and we have to imply very heavily on a number of issues uh, that the opposite. And I don't imagine this is the place that we should go and run through that sort of tactic. But there are many issues on which you can make a very good case. And it's we, we, we were pushed onto the back foot by the project shout. We were stopped from doing this as in, in the campaign. So we neither have the positive campaign that Greens have um, as strongly nationally, but we didn't really counter fire with fire. So we ended up in a halfway house. So next time round, we have to have a little bit of that fire. We have to put out, I think one is stuff on the bad boys is quite fabulous. And it's not seen on the media, as you know. But when you're in a, when you're in a campaign, a referendum campaign, you are in control of what's seen to, um, to a much greater extent. So we need those pictures. You've been lied to by these men. This man, this man made 300 million pounds on this day. These crooks have cheated you. Now we've all heard that lately, but we've never seen it quite so in your face. And that, I'm afraid, I agree, positive, yes, but actually, you you are the woman to put together <laughs> the biggest of it. So that's what that's what we. Right. So I'm going to follow on from the comments previously as well. So firstly, and sort of tying up with Mark's point about yeah, if we if we get this thing, we damn well better make sure we win it. Um, but you know, we know that what's in front of us right now is not good enough for our country, spectacularly not for Northern Ireland, and actually also the three of us represent Gibraltar, and it's not good enough for Gibraltar. Going back to that meeting about Bournemouth, it was the one time I got booed in the whole campaign, was when uh, the Conor Burns and his motley crew simply couldn't compute with a Labour MEP going, I care about Gibraltar, I'm going to stand up for it. Because that's, you know, they like to flag wave around, uh, around Gibraltar and it's just uh, exactly the opposite <coughs> of what they were doing, as 96% remain vote showed in Gibraltar. Right, in terms of, but in terms of that and in terms of, Alice, your point about the benefits of being in the EU, we get this referendum, it's going to be like last time in that it's not going to be about the EU. It's going to be about the UK. However much all of us care deeply about the EU and uh, want to have a conversation about how great the EU is, um, it's, in reality, we have to be talking about people's lives here. And I'll just run through, because actually there's a lot of focus group work being done on this, and uh, the distilled outcome is, Actually, 
I agree with Julie and Molly in terms of we've got to highlight yeah, the criminality, highlight the, um, the conspiracies, if you like, behind uh, some of the stuff around Aaron Banks and the others and the, um, the prosecutions. But I would say explicitly, don't tell people they were lied to. That way, they think that they've, you know, that they've been stupid. You know, yeah. that, that, that somehow they, were, they have allowed themselves to be fooled. What you should say, and there are three things, no one voted for this. The promises haven't been kept. So that, you know, that's a kind of headline thing that works. This is much worse. Secondly, this is much worse than we have now. So, you know, and I think that is breaking through. That is absolutely breaking through now. Uh, and finally, because this is true, this is absolutely true with the political declaration. If we go with what the, what's on offer at the moment with the, as I say, but it's particularly the political declaration, Brexit's gonna go on forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because we're just going to keep having fights because none of them are resolved. In fact, they're all left wide, gaping open in that political declaration. So if you want Brexit to be over, vote Remain. <laughs> <laughs> really really wanted to respond to that because the day after and certainly in the days after it may even have been the day after the uh, referendum result i had an email from somebody who is a consultant in these statistics in the southwest and uh, he talked about all the people that were in that operating theater who were portuguese who were you know, all from other european nationalities he owned up to originally being Scottish. <laughs> and, uh, the English person was on the operating table having his life saved mm -hmm. because of that. Mm -hmm. And it, um, you know, it really does but sort of cut to the core of this is that you know, the, the people and lives that uh, on, the on the operating table of Brexit that we, uh, we've got to, <coughs> which is why we've got to win this. And on the technical point about the um, the EHIC, then I, I actually think EHIC carries on in the transition period, is my understanding, but I will take that away uh, and double check that because yeah, I, I had understood that that carries on. But third country status, you know, and beyond um, the red lines that May has put down. So yeah, the one thing that she had ensured was in the political declaration was ending freedom of movement. That's the one that cuts us out of almost everything we've talked about. So that's uh, certainly beyond 2020 if she gets her way. I've seen. Can I just add one thing, which is that the with the EHIC, it's the same as, as the freedom of movement. It's a reciprocal. Uh, and the thing to say to Michelle Donovan, and the thing we need to say in the campaign is, you're only thinking about the X amount that the UK will save because we won't have to treat uh, Europeans in our hospitals. We get it when we go there. And it's the same with freedom of movement. You've taken hours away as well. So I think that reciprocal issue has to come by in the next campaign because most people will, will not respond until they realise that when they go to Germany, they won't have it. Yeah. it you know, they don't really care about foreigners coming here. We see that, we know that from the way people behave. But they do care about them or their children having an accident in Greece or Cyprus on holiday and not having the children there. Yeah. Many, I saw a figure saying, only 60% of Brits don't take out holiday insurance anymore because they just rely on the e e mm -hmm. Wow, that's a lot of people to tell. People yeah. won't be able to do that anymore. So I've seen at least two more people indicate if we have all. <laughs> so definitely um, the gentleman in the back, and um, Claire here at the front, um, and let's go to the middle there. Um, yes, have, have you got a mic, everybody? I'm, I'm John, but I'm not very uh, that important. You can't hear. When we voted for the Brexit, 
either get in or out. Calvin said, you're either in or out. Why don't we stand firm and say we're going to stay out or in? Because there's too much pussyfooting around. Everybody's kissing each other and loving each other on TV, but they're not doing anything. They're only costing this country a lot of money, and you don't realize it. The point is, how much has it cost two and a half years? They haven't told you how much it costs for guards, parties, functions, and everything else. They haven't told you what it costs. So Brexit has got its price, absolutely. They have been employing 7,000 more civil servants already. Another thing, the borders of Ireland should be left like it is. Why can't it remain like it is? If we even get out of Brexit, we should stand firm and look after our own country, England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales. Make sure each one is satisfied. Claire, um, what does the panel... Hello, um, Claire Thomas. Um, what does the panel think about extending the franchise to the 5 million and 16 to 17 year olds? And if you do support it, how would you counter the argument that it's just a ruse to get a remain win? <laughs> and in the middle here. I am fairly can sir. Um, we've all heard the phrase the EU is not perfect, but and I on the last point I'm worried that you know this just trying to stop the dragon on the next 20, 30 years or however long. Um, but actually the to win the hearts and minds of leavers, we do actually need to or I think the EU does need to demonstrate change somehow. Now I know that can take many forms, but actually I'd like to ask each person on the panel, can you see Areas where the EU can demonstrate that they have the ability to change, for example, inefficiencies or you know all these you know all these horrible phrases we hear about you know unelected bureaucrats. You're not. I'm absolutely sure you're not. But all of these things I think do need to be brought forward into the PR campaign to enable people, if you like, um, of what the EU does for us because currently many are not just not aware. People don't even know they've got an MP, let alone what the what the EU does. Um, that's my question. Uh, I'll take the franchise extension because I guess we might have different views on that, so we've got to all um, take a view on it. And I, I think there's a strong case for the change of the franchise, but I think it would be completely bonkers because if you, if you, for example, let uh, all of the EU nationals vote, which I dearly love to do, I would dearly love to do, you will forever be told that you manipulated the result. I am really confident that we can win the people's vote on the same franchise. And again, you will have an interminable consultation period if you try to change the franchise. It just can't be done in, in the time period. It, uh, it just can't be done. So I don't think that we, we need to waste time thinking about it. I just think it's not going to happen. Now, if we leave and then we come back at some point in the future, and it will be quite a long way, I'll be well into my um, dotage by then. Absolutely, the franchise is on the table because there's no way it should have been done on that franchise, but to, to, to fiddle with it would just, uh, just cause complications that would make it um, really hard to use. Um, to Charles, I'd simply like to say um, would that life were simple and that you could just say, uh, it's easy, it's either in or it's out, there are no complications, nothing is that simple. I'm sorry, it is complicated, it's very complicated. You cannot, you cannot uh, make statements like we should just leave the border open. <laughs> These are international treaty agreements and they have ramifications that have to be taken into account. They were not taken into account largely before this referendum was run. And they, they, they simply have to be. So I'm sorry, I'd like to live in that simple world, but we don't. Um, and maybe I'll leave the last one, but I'll have to come back on it and say as I say. So, um, yes, I mean, and in terms of the costs since the referendum, 
Actually, it's, it's a slightly inconvenient number because it's 40 billion. <laughs> and it's a bit too close to the 39 billion that actually is the amount that we're going to be paying in the, um, in the referendum process. But that's you know, loss to GDP, that's all the things that you know, we're now at the bottom of the OECD growth ranking, we're um, way behind where we ought to be. But actually, it's not just our public debt, if you like. I'm, by coincidence, was having a conversation with somebody yesterday who works for a, um, a major international bank, and he told me the calculation that they have done is that Brexit has cost them £400 million already. In all, for all sorts of reasons, in terms of preparation, in terms of investment, yeah, and this is one bank. So you imagine what else has been going on in all sorts of other parts of the economy. So there's actual costs, there's financial costs, there's the additional department costs, and one that breaks my heart is the opportunity cost. Because while well, Brexit is sucking the life out of our politics, we are not dealing with the crisis in our NHS. Last winter, we had the worst excess deaths figures for 40 years. That's what Westminster should be preoccupied with. The fact that the next generation can't get housing, that's what Westminster should be preoccupied with. Those are the things that we need to be dealing with. And instead, if this goes on the way it is, then all we are going to be dealing with is stopping Brexit for years to come. So those are the consequences. We'll quickly just pick on the other two points, which is extending. I agree completely with Julie that you know we stick with the franchise. We've got we haven't got time to change it, but I will still campaign for 16, 17 year olds to get the vote because it's partly because they're in the education system. If you vote in your first election, you're much likely to carry on voting. We are shockingly bad at political education in this country in our schools, and that's also something that has to go hand in hand with giving 16, 17 year olds the vote. <laughs> Finally, on um, the EU's not perfect, but two things I'll say to that. One is we haven't got time to resolve the um, what the hell do we want to make it better. Actually, we you know, let's let's just not cede that territory. Westminster is EU's not perfect. Westminster's not perfect. Local government isn't perfect. Get over it. <laughs> yeah, let's let's keep what we've got inside the EU. But the second thing I'll say on that as well is um, I was interviewed on the James O'Brien show a week ago, and uh, he actually had also interviewed Julian and he said, uh, but why haven't I heard of the two of you? And yeah, the answer to that is because we don't report the EU in this country. And that's the problem we've got. So let's take the challenge back here. Let's say, why haven't you been reporting? I mean, we don't do anything but the EU on our news headlines now, but up to 2016, nobody knew the first thing about the EU, except what national parties and national media <coughs> told them Brussels had done to them. Yeah, that is also a reform we've got to work on from now on in as well. Thank you. <laughs> I want to say one thing. We have never, never mentioned that Europe, Europe has been the biggest peace project in the world. We've got to mention it. And one more thing but that I, I know is going a, a little too far for a lot of people. Our net contribution is £10 billion um, to the European Union. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with creating solidarity across Europe and help those economies that need growing? Because then the people won't come, they will stay at home. Because who would actually uproot and go somewhere where it's completely unknown if they actually have plenty of good opportunities at home? So remember solidarity as well. For me, that's a very, very important um, plus point of the European Union. Sorry about this. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't add the climate change crisis to, to Claire's list. And I totally agree with her about the fact that we're diverted from this most important crisis, the uh, uh, of Brexit. I will just say to Charles, 
it's not your fault that it was portrayed to you in that way as being so simple. I mean, I've got a whole slide full of lists from Brexiteers saying how we could sort all this out for an afternoon and how simple it will be to get out of the EU. They just lied about that. We have been entwined in this organisation for 40 years. It was always going to be complex and technical getting out. And there's just no two ways about that. Um, extending the franchise, strangely, we all three agree about this. We all would like to change the franchise, but we're all pragmatic that the most important thing is to make sure the people's votes held and time is short. I think we all support votes for 16 and 17 year olds, don't we? Yes. And Julie's not sure. We'll, we'll have to work a bit on that, but the other two of us do. Um, so I'm going to go for your question. Um, I thought that the Commission was full of unelected bureaucrats until I became an MEP, because I've been reading all the same stuff you've been reading. And uh, now I work a lot with those, you know, bureaucrats, faceless bureaucrats. They all have faces, obviously. Um, and now they have names for me and they're doing really good work and I work with them and I, I feel quite ashamed and embarrassed actually and for years I just believed that tribe that I heard from somewhere. Of course they're, they're not elected because they're the civil service effectively and we don't elect our civil service either and that's appropriate. It's slightly more political, well it's quite a lot more political than our civil service because we're a club rather than a nation state. So because nobody's holding the governance function in the way our government does, we have to have some political power vested in the commission. But those commissioners come from all the member states. So that's, to, to me, I, it seems a very good, well-organised system now that I understand it better. Um, and I kind of agree with Claire that it's best not to stick on this turf, but there's a lot of things I would change about the European Union. The point of us as European politicians is we are constantly changing things. That's, that's what we do as politicians. I think the, the biggest lie that got out early on during the referendum campaign was this idea that Europe was undemocratic. This is why the BBC is not allowing any of us out onto the airwaves now, because we are sort of living proof that the European Union is democratic, because you all voted for us, or well, maybe none of us, but anyway, you had the chance to. Um, and so I think it's absolutely crucial that we do challenge that. I mean, I, I sat on a panel with Billy Bragg and Ben Bradshaw, and. Uh, Billy Bragg actually said, I always say this because Billy Bragg voted for me and I'm so proud of that. But, you know, there was a woman there who said, you know, the European Union is totally undemocratic. So Billy Bragg said, well, how can that be? Because here's Molly and I voted for her and she's my representative. And she said, that's not possible because the European Union is totally undemocratic. And there we are. So be polite, it's a very effective technique. But I, obviously we are all trying to change things about the European Union. The biggest thing I would change is lobbying. I would also change that at Westminster. It's not a thing unique about the European Union, but I think it's really damaging to our politics, the fact that we allow lobbying without transparency, and I would actually crack down on, on lobbying even if people were transparent about it. But the biggest thing that blocks the positive changes we're trying to make as European politicians is what happens in the Council. We work with the, co the Commission very cooperatively, but then stuff gets to the council, we have to negotiate with the council, that's the end point of making law, a negotiation effectively between the, the co-legislators, ourselves in the parliament, and the council where the member states are represented. The member states are not agreeing, there's a failure of solidarity and cooperation there, and that's what's blocking the changes we need to see. Why don't we have a, a, a European migration policy, because the council can't agree? Why does the work I get done, I do in the parliament to stop people avoiding paying their taxes not happen? the council won't agree. This is the biggest problem with European policy making at the moment. It's our national governments in the council blocking positive change. You don't hear that, but that's the reality. And I, but, but for all sorts of reasons, largely about the complexity of this, and very few people would have the confidence to talk about this, I would, because I'm there, as are my colleagues here. But I think there's two ways of playing this. We either go down the route, route stop Brexit, change Europe, or we go down the route stop Brexit, change Britain. My view is most of the problems that gave rise to the Brexit vote were problems created here. And so I think we should take that route. So, one question I actually have um, to the panel when um, all this big change in the European Union about um, being more integrated is going to come along. This will go to, is going to be something that if there is a people's vote debate, people will be talking the European army, um, uh, 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 European super state. Let's um, maybe have some answers from you, whether you think this is actually something that is seriously being discussed or whether that is now project fear from the Brexit uh, campaigners. Well, if you talk about the European army, uh, it's absolutely clear that it's being discussed because there are many 
in the States for the European one is a very attractive option. Uh, Germany, there, you know, if Germany notoriously can't get the only two tanks it has onto the road because there's no parts. And, and Germany, it's absolutely in their interest to have a European army because historically they don't have that military background. And I don't know. Um, I don't think Europe would necessarily want to see some, some of the European states building large armies. So it's quite logical that they might pull resources and want to do things together. The issue for me is whether it becomes mandatory for all EU members or whether it's something that they can bilaterally and multilaterally agree to do. And at the moment, that looks like the way it's going to go. That there will be um, some, there already is the European Defence Force, and that's largely an ad hoc work. Well, it's, a little, it's a little bit more than ad hoc, but it, it's a it, it's a way in which we pool our defence resources when necessary. We have in place the ways in which our various national armies can work together. We have command and control systems in place. We have sharing of weapons. We have, for example, famously sharing of things like aircraft carriers, as the UK uh, used the French one for a long time before we launched our recent addition. Um, so all of these things, I think that, that's, that's the thing you have to get across about Europe. It's, it's a, it is a series of uh, very broad agreements, but it's also a very strong network of multilateral and bilateral agreements under that. And the UK, having a European army is an issue for veto. So anyone, any one member state can say no. And I have heard in the last week or two from some member states, and from some quite senior people in the Commission, that oh, now we can get it, go ahead with putting together plans for the European Army. Now the UK is not going to be here. But then I've heard from other member states, oh my goodness, how are we going to stop it? Because whilst we may have the right of veto, we're a tiny country, and we wouldn't wish to use that veto for other political reasons. So it is very complex. But I'm absolutely confident that on integration, no, none of the integration will be compulsory. So people will be able to join together <laughs> in things that are important to them and do them together or stay out of it. And that's a really big issue. We have a, we have a deal at the moment which allows us to stay out of quite a lot. And I can suspect many in this room, including myself, would like to be in more than we're out of, that we're currently out of, but we won't be having that argument at the moment. So in my view, uh, we just need to get across that Europe is not a command and control structure. That, that's, that's what we're being told. It's not, it's actually around agreements, it's around compromise, it's around multilateralism, and it's around allowing yourself to be accepted, accepted from deals that you don't want to be, like the Euro or whatever. Um, you, you, we've, got, we've got about 10 minutes left, I think. We have another round of questions if there's appetite. If you we'll do another round of questions and then I'll pick up on one of the points. Um, so let's go the front here, um, Hugh in the middle, and uh, this is so difficult, people. Um, yeah, let me. Well, there's so many people, so let, let, let's just have you. And, and if you if you keep it very quick, then maybe we can take another quick round of questions, and if you answer quickly as well. Okay, uh, so given that um, it's agreed that there's about 35% of the people in the middle, neither for or against, and given the limited resources and the dirty tricks and dirty money that will be pouring in to actually <laughs> um, pull those votes, uh, do you agree that our best um, resources are creativity? And so, um, we, you know, we've mentioned posters and music. Um, you know, the music industry makes five billion pounds. If we could actually get all the artists who are pro-Europe to actually have a coalition and come up with creative um, graphics, because graphics are a very good way of competing against um, headlines. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Hugh Spann. Part of my role in life is to be negative. Um, and there's one thing that concerns me about people's vote. Um, Michael Ashcroft did a huge 
poll on the evening of the referendum, and he found that, or well, the findings suggested that nearly a quarter of Remain voters uh, believed that leaving the EU would make little or no difference to us economically. Now that number may have shrunk, but I suspect there's still an appreciable number of Remain voters, and I'm concerned that some Remain voters would vote Leave on a second vote because they felt that Leave had won fair and square and it wasn't really right, or simply because they were afraid that um, you know, it would be too divisive. And, and I, I, I wonder if you think that is a serious uh, threat and how you would counter it. Okay, and I'd say to you. Okay, quite a similar question actually. Uh, there, are, there, are, there are those who are saying that if there is um, you know, another referendum, it's just going to be so nasty, um, create far more social, much, much more social division, much more than we've had over the last two or three years. No matter what positive messages we come out with, it's going to be very close, the result, very likely. You know, the chances, um, he says, it, we, we, we might lose it. I just wonder, you know, if you've got any comments on, on that. Okay, Claire, can I ask you? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I <coughs> so, in terms of the creativity, uh, yes, so we've got brilliant people on our side and also we've got some great big names although it turns out they don't actually shift the dial so much the big names as a good meme can do or a gif or whatever yeah. um, and I think that is something that actually in 2016 the Leave campaign did more successfully than we did which was that kind of social media element and also a whole load of them as we saw with Molly's slide they also did all the Cambridge Analytica stuff and all of you know, that, uh, the, um, the cheating that sat alongside that. But, you know, I would like to think that we could kind of mobilise, I, I would say, that we did, we got some very good social media in the Labour Party and we got uh, uh, some pretty positive stuff in the 2017 election and I would like to see that kind of thing replicated, built on and mobilised in this campaign and by the way i'm pretty damn certain it would be uh if we got to this referendum campaign so yes that's that's an element we have to get i was looking at the figures today funnily enough of the um at the point at which the postal votes hit uh mat, mat, near doormats and it was at the same time that they put the turkey poster up and that's because the leave campaign worked out we're going to peak here and they did, they peaked in the polls. That's when we started seeing the leave, you know, leave winning in the polls, because they perfectly timed it. And so all of these things we've got to, uh, we've got to learn the lessons of last time, and frankly do a bloody sight better this time around on our side. Um, the, uh, the remainers made a leap. Okay, so until recently, I've been disappointed by the kind of scale of shift that there's been kind of leave remain, although it has shifted to remain. Actually, that is, again, it's this point about now we've got something real. It is, yeah, the, that shift is starting to happen quite significantly. So yes, there are going to be remainers that are going to vote leave because, you know, democracy apparently only gets to happen once on something like this. Um, but equally, and I, I am sure you've all had those conversations, and I certainly have had a lot of those conversations where you've got lead voters who are saying, I regret, you know, I, I, I would vote differently now. And um, so there is, there are more of those now than there are remainers going the other way. But the point, um, you know, and then it's down to the campaign and things will shift in the campaign and we have to do a good campaign to win the votes as well. I'm, I'm not, I absolutely don't think this is in the bag, but I do think it is much better that we deal with this quickly. There's no pretty end to Brexit. Mm. It either ends in one form of Brexit or another, mm. or it ends in Remain. And there isn't an easy route to ending in Remain. The referendum is the only one that we can, uh, we can get through in time before uh, May would want to drag us out. The social division is really important. We already have it, and it's not going 
away. In this region, the people that are in the PREVENT program, whatever you think of the PREVENT program, but you know, the anti-terrorism program in our communities are all far-right activists. That's what our police forces are worried about. That's actually now what our security forces are worried about. This is, this is there. It, it's out there. The genie's out of this bottle. We've got work to do to put it back in. But actually, you know, I genuinely don't think the referendum, we, we can't. We can't run away from this no. because we're afraid of far right or you know, extremists or you know, Tommy Robinson or you know, Stephen Laxley. Laxley Lennon is actually called. Cool. We are, I'm not going to run away from those people. I'm going to face them down. And I think that's what we should be doing. They don't represent our country. Yes, I, I agree with that. And just to say that I do think that we're going to have a divided country for an awfully long time on all those. I'd just rather deal with it when we've got the economy is not tanking and uh, young people have got some hope for the future where life uh, is not being. Because uh, I think, I mean, I really do think it's going, if we have a, either the deal. Which is only a transition period. That's all this deal is, is giving us a transition period. We do not know what's going to happen after Brexit. I'm absolutely sure it's going to be really, really dismal. Uh, so I would much rather be in a position where we've dealt with rebuilding our country and, dare I say, with the help of the 27 members of the European Union who would want our country to become strong and free and open again. And I always believed, uh, bear in mind that I have been a member of the Tory party for 40 years, I'm not now because I've been expelled, but I understand how these people work. I understand how, how it works, and I always thought that the worst thing about Brexit was going to be what is unleashed in terms of the other undercurrents of political belief. There is a, an almost 100% um, um, parallel between anti-Europe and, and not believing in climate change. So whilst it says in uh, the 26 pages that we're going to be, uh, or I likes to think of us as continuing to lead on climate change, <laughs> uh -huh, um, <laughs> we, I, am under, I have no doubt at all that that will not happen after Brexit. I have no doubt at all that we will, we will start to slip down um, and we will start to, to, to row back on some of the things that we've done. And we are by no means a front, front runner. So clean air, all these things I could go on and on. So I honestly think we'd be in a better position, albeit I don't pretend it's going to heal anything. I just think it's going to mean that we've got a slightly stronger platform to go, go forward. Um, you know, the next generation are going to have to step up and rebuild, and I think they will have it. Because it, it won't be for me. I've become so obsessed with, with Brexit that you know, I'm like a robot. I'd have to be reprogrammed afterwards <laughs> to do anything else. But, I, but there are loads of great people, some in this room, who will do that work. But we've got to give them that platform on which to start building. <laughs> I hope I'm on beer, but I don't have as much time as those two. Surely I can. Um, no, I'll be as quick as I can. Look, the Prosecco makers of Italy and the car makers of Germany have not ridden to our rescue. We haven't got the cake and eat it deal. We've got the crappy deal that we said we'd get all along, and it's much worse than the deal we've got being in the EU. And that's why we've got to win the referendum, because the promises that were made have been broken. So we're in a very strong position to, to argue that and to win this. Um, I'm getting somebody to write me a report at the moment exactly how that cheating worked through Facebook and then we've got strong recommendations to come in to stop them cheating next time around. We shouldn't have adverts paid for with foreign money. We shouldn't have adverts being sent by Canada which contain lies. We can stop that happening next time. We won't be able to have legislation but we're working with Facebook voluntarily. They didn't do that during the Irish abortion referendum and we can insist that they don't do it during a people's vote. So the whole psychological manipulation element can be can be taken out. Watch out for Michael Ashcroft, he's one of my bad boys of Brexit. You can find out why on the website. Uh, the polls are shifting our way. Considering how bad this is, it is surprising they haven't shifted more rapidly in my view. But 
basically a lot of people are saying, oh, it's probably easier if I just keep my head down and let this go, go on, rather than having to conflict over it. No, this is about the future of our country. We're going to fight this. And if they think that British people are going to be intimidated by threats of violence, they don't know us very well. I mean, I was in Devizes last week. I had a room full of people, metaphorically, with torches and pitchforks, furious about this. I grew up in Bath. I know that people in Bath are not going to give in to intimidation. You know, you've got four women on this platform who are not going to be intimidated by big violent guys in the street. So we can all be bold. We can work together. We can win this argument. We can get the people's vote. We can win it and we can stay in the EU. Thank you. To Molly, to Julie, to Claire, a very rich discussion. We could have gone on forever, couldn't we? But it is time to um, sort of wind up, mingle a little bit. How long do we have the room? Um, Till half past. Till half past, so we've got a bit of time to have our discussions. There is the bar still, there are the merchandise, our campaign needs funding, so please buy the berries, the, um, the wristbands, and let's not give up. We are closer now than we were ever before. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you to the panel.